Are you in a couple looking for a third? Or are you single and searching for a dating app that actually encourages you to embrace your sexual side? Field values sex positivity and encourages you to share your desires and interests directly to your profile. You can share freely about how traditional or how kinky you may be. And here's some great news. You can download the app for free by going to field.co. Just click on the link in our episode description to get the Field app for free today. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I am so excited to have Tina Horn, podcaster and writer here on the show. She has just released the new podcast Operator through Wondery, and she also has a graphic novel out, uh, Safe Sex Volume 2, Terms of Service. So middle wide cam, make sure that you are sparkle, seeing this sparkle. sparkle. It's a really a beautiful cover. Oh yeah. Tula Lotea did the, the cover art. She's amazing. So gorgeous. Looks Thank just you. like me. Don't it you does. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. The curly hair is what did it <laughs> definitely don't have tits like that, but that's okay. <laughs> Welcome Tina. Thank you so much for coming. I am so stoked to be here. Yay. Oh, I didn't ask, uh, I, cause I just assumed because of the kinds of things that we're going to talk about. Can I? Yeah. Yes. I was going to say so fucking glad. And then yes. I was like, oh God, we were just talking about Ira Glass. What would, would Ira Glass be mad at me for say fucking, but for I, saying I fucking. I feel like <laughs> he would feel like it was a duty to bleep it out, but it, in his heart, he would be okay with it. Cool. Cool. That's so how you're, I You're like the Ira Glass of porn. <laughs> Don't let me head get too big. I wish, man. I, I love that guy. He's he's incredible. I feel I still feel like I'm even though I've been doing this podcast for almost four years, I still feel like I'm stumbling along and um I, you know, I'm tripping over myself and asking stupid questions and giving stupid answers. And but you know, I think we're our own worst critic, right? That's true, our own worst enemies, but also it's your fucking show. So that's like, true. whatever you want to do, that's, that's a true. show. That's it. I do feel like saying that sometimes to like people who leave shitty comments. I'm like, it's my fucking show. If you don't like it, don't listen to it. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't read comments. <laughs> that's, that's just like an, an area. I don't spelunk into that. And, <laughs> you know, because like, exactly. Like anybody can make a show now, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. So like, if you don't like it, make your own show. Yeah. The end. Yeah. Exactly. So tell us a little bit about how you got into um, writing and podcasting about the sex industry. Oh, man. I mean, I guess the way to answer that is that I got my start in my career in sexuality in the sex industry. Mm. Oh, scandalous. I know that you are so shocked. By oh, this. my God. All of your listeners are like, oh, can this person even be a respectable authority. <laughs> I already feel like like your bad um, influence is like rubbing off on me. I know. I'm, like, I'm kind of seeing it. Deviant. It's like a cloud gathering <laughs> above you. Uh, yeah, no, um, I, uh, I started working as a professional dominatrix. I feel like that's not a term I have to unpack here. That's nice. Um, uh, in 2005. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I worked in the porno. Ever heard of it? No. Uh, <laughs> What's that? And, uh, well... Um, you know, you wear tank tops and you talk into mics and it's based, that's, that's it. That's, oh, yeah? that's all porn okay. is really okay. the all adult, right. adult entertainment. Uh, yeah. So I got into that and then I sort of transitioned into like being a journalist and nonfiction writer and science fiction writer, um, and podcaster and educator, but all of the themes of my work have like never really changed from like being in the dungeon or being on porn sets and by porn sets, I mean like my like various bedrooms in Oakland. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. So I, I guess like I always knew that I was going to pursue a career in writing and media making and sexuality is, I, I guess like, everybody has one thing that all of their work ends up being about. And mm -hmm. for me, it's sex and like maybe 
m more both more broadly and more specifically like sex and power you know mm. so a lot of bdsm stuff i teach a lot of like workshops for grown-ups about like you know how to be like well like what bdsm is and how to communicate better about it and how to like i don't know um like understand it better so you can enjoy it mm -hmm. so you can enjoy the things that you want to enjoy um and then in my journalism, I talk a lot about the sex industry and like sexual labor rights and um, just kind of like trying to demystify the industry. Because do you find this? I feel like people think of porn and like sex work in general as something that like I, I say this in the operator podcast, which we're going to talk about as something that like springs to life spontaneously like a weed, you know, that it just like occurs in nature somehow but like and people forget about the work of sex mm -hmm. work and people don't think about like a porn shoot as being like any other video shoot mm -hmm. um and i feel like being able to both talk about the like labor elements of the sex industry and talking about the sexuality aspects of it too which i you know i love talking about like I said, power. I love talking about desire. I love talking about like all the wacky things that we like to do. I like, I like the glamor. I like the entertainment part of it too. Mm -hmm. So, um, I try to like find that balance in mm -hmm. my work. Um, yeah. And so I do a lot of different things exploring all of that. Yeah. I mean, I think that people, you know, and you're right, there is like a cloak of mystery that, that covers the porn industry and so many people, have these misconceptions about it. And, you know, one of the most common things that I see like challenges to the idea that sex work is work. It's like, oh, it's not work. You just like come in and spread your legs and lay on your back. Like you're a lazy whore. And Man, if you've ever, <laughs> if you've ever spread your legs on your back, then you will know bottoming is work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, any, anybody who, I, I, and obviously like, it's not it like it isn't just like sometimes it is just that mm -hmm. but also like that's like work means exchanging something like like two different things of value right mm -hmm. so like if a service or a product or content is of value to someone and then they're like willing to exchange like money or you know uh any anything of value like for that that's the marketplace, baby. Like, yeah, you know? supply and demand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean that that stigma of like, oh well, like you're a lazy whore is like, I don't know. I hear that and I'm like, honey, what's going on with you? Like, what's your insecurity? Like, sounds like you wish that you could do that yeah. for work. Sounds like you're. You're jealous. Why are you so obsessed with us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think also too in this new like age of entrepreneurship where the internet has given people so much autonomy over their careers and so much control, right? That if you want to be successful, um, you know, cause the studios are still around and they're still doing well, but it's kind of not like it was, it's not yeah. as easy to get a contract now and just have a studio take care of you totally. and pay for everything. And all you have to do is show up and like do your scenes, be the talent. Yeah. you know, and now these days with like only fans and stuff like that, like anyone who has a successful only fans account will tell you like, they have to work a lot. I mean, cause it's about engagement. Your fans Absolutely. want to speak to you and they want, um, that interaction. They want custom videos. Um, there's there's a lot to it that I think that people don't think about. And, and then obviously the behind the scenes of productions is somebody, you know, my days are 12 hours, 10 hours if I'm lucky, but they're long. Yeah, and it, and it does, it involves those mundane elements of production and a lot of it looks like being hunched over a computer or like hopefully like ergonomically properly sitting in front of a computer. But sitting on a yoga ball with your back straight. Absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, also even that thing that you're describing, that like cult of personality um, engagement, mm -hmm. like that is also labor. Like that's not just the fun part. Mm -hmm. the, it looks, the reason that it looks to people like, you know, the the performance of social media, the, the performance of like personhood or being casual or just hanging out, like the reason that it looks like that is because it's a, a performance that requires like preparation and talent and like finesse and mm -hmm. experience. Like that's why some people are better at it than others. Yeah. And it's the same with sex. Like 
if you ever watch amateur porn, you know that like, if, if you look at amateur porn, like actual amateur porn, like people just like setting up an exhibitionist, like setting up a camera in their bedroom and then having the same poorly lit sex that they always have, which, mm -hmm. you know, more power to exhibitionists, fantastic. But like, and then you look at like porn with good production values, which like I, at this point, like cannot watch I cannot get off to poorly lit porn. <laughs> like, mm. I'm like a very like fancy high production value um, <laughs> sort of person. But anyway, enough about my tastes. Uh, like if you look at the difference between like really accomplished porn performers and like, you know, just your like regular Joe and Jane Schmo or Joe and Joe Schmo uh, exhibitionists, like porn, star the thing that, I think that porn stars do that is so extraordinary is like making something that is for most people who never like perform or get paid for anything related to their sexuality is like a very internal experience mm -hmm. and they make it external. And I'm not just talking about like rosebuds and cream pies external, mm -hmm. you know, I'm talking about like the, <laughs> like the experience of pleasure, the, even the experience, the experience of intimacy, the experience of passion, even like in, um, you know, scenes that are scenes. That are Sorry. I can't get over what you just said. Because the Do rosebuds not come in here talking about rosebuds all the, the time. The rosebuds thing didn't hit me for a second because I thought maybe you were talking about like I don't know like romance? flowers and romance. <laughs> and then when you said cream pie, I understood what you meant. And then external. Anyways, sorry. Just, no, I'm just coming in here. That was just a very clever. You. It was very clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, it's it's refreshing. Sometimes I have to like censor myself with these kinds of things. So I'm yeah. like no. here ready to be <laughs> vulgar. Yes. With you. Love it. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Like the, the, like when you're just like having sex or, you know, like having a BDSM scene, like with one other person, you might be thinking about like what they're seeing or what they're feeling or what they're experiencing. Hopefully you're thinking about that a little bit. Um, but you're you're not thinking about like we were just talking about uh like enunciating or projecting right like if you're in a theater you can't just like have a conversation with somebody on the stage you mm -hmm. have to like project to mm -hmm. you know the cheap seats yeah. and um and i feel like yeah the performance of sex is really about um like yeah i mean making just... it so that that's like that that's sort of like comprehensible to the to the voyeur you right. know because it's really about like providing entertainment to the voyeur which is why working with new people is difficult because they don't understand the concept of we call what we call opening up mm. which means that basically like you know because normally when you're in missionary um you know if it's between a man and a woman the girl the woman's legs are kind of wrapped around the guy and but you need to see penetration in porn so the guy has to kind of have sex you gotta sideways, cheat out yeah yeah open his hip and you know, always have to be aware of the camera and look towards it and make sure that, you know, they can see everything they need to see. And that's something that only an experienced performer generally understands. Totally. So there's definitely, um, like an art to it for sure. Absolutely. And that's why, like, you know, I mean, my, my comic is in part about sex robots and like, that's one thing that I find really fascinating about the con the concept of sex robots. Like if you ever watch like fucking machine porn, I remember the aha moment that I had where it was like, oh, it's you, you, you're seeing the penetration like you were talking about, like you're seeing like a dildo like going in and out of a hole um, in a body, in a person's body. <laughs> but, um, but then like you're taking the like pesky person at, like attached. <laughs> the torso to, that like, always blocks yeah, it. Like yeah, like out of it. And it's like, you know, with all due respect to the people who are often attached to those dicks, it's like, you kind of just want them to be transparent. Yeah. You know, you kind of want to be able to like have x-ray vision through them to like see the pussy, like, yeah. and uh, you know, the fucking machines offer that. And, yeah. I, and I feel like, um, you know, potentially sex robots could like offer that as well because they could like be human shaped or they could be like any shape that you want for like any purpose that you want. They could have like a transparent middle, like yeah. a little like window. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like yeah. when, yeah, you could like go, it could be like a peep show where you yeah. go up to the window and like look through, you go, you like go up to the ass of the like Android and then like open a little ass <laughs> door and like, you know, you have to pay, you could put in a coin maybe 
and then you like look through and then you're like right up and you kind of have the the pov like it's like the dick is coming out of your nose and you're like fucking it anyway <laughs> wow god there's just like so many possibilities it's like endless. they're limitless yeah it's funny when you were talking about the whole positioning thing my the first thing that came to mind was oh my god this is why triple anals are so hard to shoot like it is so hard to shoot three guys with their dick in a butthole because of the torsos That's right. and like the leg pesky, placement pesky torsos. It's so so I've never shot a triple anal, but every time I see like a picture or a video of one, I'm like, wow, that was that it's, like it's that took you. Yeah. I mean, that, that was tough. Yeah. Like you guys worked on that one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what I love about one of my favorite genres of porn is the gangbang. And like, mm. and I've been on set like, uh, in various capacities, um, mm. of gangbang porn. And like, when you, have the chance to like really watch it happening. It's, it's like a ballet. It is. I've said that so many times. It has to be, it literally has to be choreographed, Yeah, you know, and there's really sophisticated, artful ways of doing it. And then there's sometimes it's also more like a sport, you know, like a little bit more sort of like brutish, but Who can uh, get in there like first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The gamification of the, of yeah. the gang bang. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, um, it, and it also is like quite beautiful. It like requires so much communication, mm -hmm. like verbal communication of like, what do you need? Do you need water? Is this position comfortable? Okay, I want to go for the double anal now. Okay, now we're going for the triple anal. But also like communication of bodies, right? Mm -hmm. That and it is like a dance, like a and you know usually the person getting penetrated is doing it backwards and in high heels. Yeah. Apparently. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've talked about this so many times in my podcast, I've shot a, a few gangbangs and because, you know, on camera we're always zoomed in to just see the girls and like the torsos of the men and the penises. Yeah. But if you're pull back and you watch the guys, they look at each other and they give each other signals like, okay, you ready? Okay. You go in. And then like, there's like this, this, it. it's, it's pretty incredible. And this is why, and actually it's funny. Um, I had a long talk with Lisa Ann about this because I shot one of her gangbangs. But it's actually more important the guys that you hire for the gangbang than the girls. Totally. Because it's actually more important that the guys like each other rather than if like they like the girls or the girls like them because they have to work with each other. And if there's like weird blood between two guys, then like someone's not getting hard. Absolutely. I mean, you know, th there's this term homosocial of mm -hmm. like people of the same sex or gender, like having a relationship that is not necessarily like erotically charged per se, but mm -hmm. it's like very intimate. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like not so secretly like that is my favorite part of like a, like five guys and one girl gangbang. I mean, I love watching girls get fucked. Mm -hmm. I will watch girls get fucked every day of my life. I hope, um, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in person or on video or whatever, or participating, but, um, there is something I also, I mean, I, I'm bisexual and I love men and mm. I like, I do sort of love like men, like working together to like, <laughs> you know, get a job done. And like, it's, it is people look at a gangbang and they don't think about it as being about pleasure. They think about I think a lot of people see the aggression mm -hmm. and like, I enjoy the aggression. It's contextualized like within, you know, mm -hmm. like a BDSM scene or like we're performing aggression, like, because that's what makes this scene exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but I also just see it as like uh, all these people working together to like make each other feel good. Yeah. It's a party. Well, and again, if you're ever like behind the scenes of a gangbang, um, you know, provided obviously you're, it's, you know, with good people, yeah. um, you'll see like the aggression happen while the camera's rolling. And then when we call cut, the guys like pull back and then they're like talking about baseball oh and they're like totally. asking the girl if she wants water, like you, okay. Was that position good? Like 100%. it's just a complete flip of the switch. Like people just think it's, it, it I mean, it really is a performance and I think people forget totally. that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, I feel like this is a perfect time to take a commercial break. We've spent 20 minutes talking about gangbangs and triple anal, How but I mean, this is we great. We slid into it. We did. We just like <laughs> penetrated that subject matter. Um, so hang tight, guys. When we come back, we're actually going to talk about what we're here to talk about, which is Tina's new podcast, 
Operator available on Wondery, and then also uh, the new graphic novel as well. So hang tight, we'll be right back. Are you in a couple looking for a third? Or are you single and searching for a dating app that actually encourages you to embrace your sexual side? Field is the alternative dating app for couples and singles. As the largest dating community of progressive humans across the globe, Field connects the curious and the open-minded. Field has built a community for awesome, ethical, like-minded people who can explore their sexuality with others free of judgment or shame. Whether you're into cuddles and long walks on the beach or shibari and BDSM, Field welcomes it all. You can share freely about how traditional or how kinky you may be. The app is inclusive to all, no matter your gender or orientation. When you join, you can choose from over 20 sexual and gender identity options. And here's some great news. You can download the app for free by going to field.co. Just click on the link in our episode description to get the Field app for free today. All right, guys, we are back. So Tina, tell us about your podcast operator. It is about the something that doesn't really exist so much anymore, but it's, it's still out there. Yeah. Um, the phone sex explosion back <laughs> like what was it the 80s? No, it was the 90s. Eight, 90s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, OK. So first of all, operator is a project that I'm incredibly proud of and it has been in. I've been involved, actually, I should say. It's been in development for a long time, but I've been involved for three years, including COVID delays. Um, but it's now, like, all out, and it's on the Wondery app. You know, it's um, released by uh, Wondery Podcast, but it's also, like, available wherever you pod. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of it, but even hearing you say, like, my new podcast, like, so much of the work that I do, I am sort of, like, a DIY punk, and I just, like, invent a project that I want and like build it from the ground up and operator is like the biggest, most mainstream thing that I was ever like asked to come in and participate in. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was in development, um, by, uh, these three executive producers who are amazing to work with and they, uh, got the very bright idea that they, you know, they had this story that they wanted to tell about nineties phone sex and this particular company called American Telnet that was a, literally billion dollar phone sex company in the nineties and the sort of rise and fall of that company. And they had the bright idea that the show should be hosted and co-written and also like reported by like, you know, the sort of research and actually like talking to the people involved by somebody who both has a background in the sex industry and also has experience as a writer and reporter covering the sex industry. Mm -hmm. So Luckily, I have enough friends and colleagues that like pointed them uh, in their search uh, towards me. And I have to say, they were right. I was totally the right person for the job. (laughs) And um, there are so many things about Operator and uh, the story that were fascinating to me. I mean, dirty talk is one of my specialties in my work. It always has been. It's sort of one of those like things... Like sometimes when you work as a dominatrix, there are some people who just like pick up rope and like instantly know how to like safely tie somebody up and like suspend them like from their toes, like from the ceiling. And I like can barely know the difference between a square knot and a granny knot. I'm I'm not like that. But when it comes to like dirty talk and role play and that sort of more like um, imagination, theatrical stuff, uh, you know, people would be like, how did you do that? And I'm like, oh, I don't, I, I don't know. I guess I have to think about how I did it. And then I started to like break it down so that I could like teach it to like my fellow sex workers and then like teach classes on it and and write about, write about how to do it. So like the, and I was, I'm happy to say I was born in 1982. So like I was like coming of age in the Mm nineties and like, I, I think I have like a really, vivid memory of like being a hormonal adolescent at a time when interactivity through technology was novel and it's mind blowing to think about the world that we're in now compared to not that yeah and where we're going and like not that many decades ago like I cannot overstate either to you know, folks who are, you know, geriatric millennials like me or Gen X, uh, like generation straddlers or like 
you know, folks older or folks like much younger who don't remember a time before smartphones and, and the internet and social media, like how interacting with a person and being able to like pay for the service of interacting with someone was so novel to people that it almost probably felt like supernatural. Like in the way that sometimes we talk about, like if somebody from the 1700s, like, you know, like showed up in like 2022, they would think that electricity was magic. Right. Like, and I think that that interactivity, like, really seemed magic to people who were calling paper call lines. So paper call lines were a new technology, 800 and 900 numbers um, in the 90s. And, you know, there were psychic hotlines like Miss Cleo. I I remember when you brought that up in the podcast, I was like, wow, I have not. I remember those commercials. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I haven't heard that name in so long. Oh, yeah, Miss Cleo. Amazing. <laughs> R.I.P. Um, but, uh, you know, and there were also like there were sports lines and there was basically like every pop culture thing that you could be a fan of, mm-hmm. you you could call. Mm-hmm. Um This is so nerdy, but like, I remember, uh, I was, uh, as an adolescent, I was a big fan of the band. They might be giants. And like, they had a, yeah, they, they had a number that, that you could dial a song that you could call. And it was like, so amazing that I could like pick up the phone and like, hear like hear a, they might be giants song. Like anyway, so it was really mind blowing, um, to, you know, for all of the different things that were offered. So of course, any technology that any technological development like gets used for sex in one way or another. And, um, uh, so American Telnet was a company that like sort of jumped on that like technological moment and like had really advanced technology in like all kinds of ways, both in terms of how they could scale the business and have, people calling all of these different numbers that they owned from, you know, like one 900 hot tits or, uh, you know, uh, one 900, uh, I'm I'm trying to remember one of them, like hot cum, but it's called cum cum with with two two M's. M's. Yeah. And I was like, (laughs) you gotta get creative. (laughs) You know, it's, it's like a, it's like a vanity plate basically. And, um, (laughs) and so, you know, they owned these numbers and they had the technology, they developed the technology um, to, to scale so that they could have a phone room um, of operators, you know. So from my perspective, the operators, the people who are actually answering the numbers were the people who are the, the sex workers, right? Mm-hmm. The people who are providing the erotic labor and like providing the erotic service. And, um, you know, with the sex industry, you often have people like videographers, uh, you know, AV people um, who are, technically working in the sex industry, but like probably like wouldn't identify as sex workers or have like, yeah. uh, like, like less stigma attached to them than the people who are talking dirty to strangers on the phone, to clients on the phone, to customers, callers on the phone, um, or the people who are actually fucking on camera or whatever. Um, and you know, the, the story of American Telnet that the company, I mean the, um, the production companies that we worked with to like make operator the podcast a reality, like wanted to sort of structurally tell about like the rise and fall of this company. And that is, that's a really solid structure that is really compelling to people like listening to podcasts. And Mm -hmm. I really liked that because it really grounds it. Like I was saying earlier in the, in the business side of it and being like, you know, like this is a business like any other business. And it has, um, things about it that are totally specific to it being about sex and that it has things about it that could they could literally be like providing anything could be any telecommunications company Mm -hmm. and so then through that I feel like I got to bring a lot of my favorite topics like how does that stigma that we were talking about earlier both for the people who work in the industry and like how people perceive like a phone sex company um, in like a government, you know, on the level of government, like um, the FCC or on the level of corporations, like at the time, like MCI and AT&T, the, the phone companies, um, what's happening in a political realm with people like Jesse Helms being like, oh no, like, you know, porn is coming through the phones and, and, you know, anti-porn regulations and like all of that stuff. And like, how did that, how did that affect the business? And, then how did that affect what was available to 
the callers, you know, to the, to the consumers of this, like, not only sexual entertainment, but also like potentially like intimate conversations. And like every sex worker knows that like a certain amount of emotional labor is always going to be a part of what they provide, even in the moments of the like filthiest, raunchiest fantasy talk that Mm -hmm. they could be engaging in. So I don't know. Um, I got to talk to all of these people who felt very passionately about this company that they worked for, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And, um, there's a lot of really fascinating characters and, um, I'm actually very proud that we got to do an episode where I, uh, in collaboration, um, with some of the other folks in the project got to like write a sort of like fictional but based on a reporting like radio play episode that is like a day in the life of an American telnet phone sex operator in the 90s and like the kind the different kinds of clients that they might have had and what their interactions with their coworkers would have been like and how they might have felt about their job and like I said dirty talk is my specialty so it was kind of fun to um write some like like a dirty talk script and then like hire actors to do it and then like put it out there on this really mainstream podcast that then hit like number one on the like Apple podcast charts. And I was like, yeah, I'm like spreading my dirty talk like all over the world. So, um, yeah, so I'm feeling, I'm feeling really good about it. The response to the show has been amazing. That's fantastic. And there is a real talent to being able to do dirty talk. I mean, it's some of these girls that I shoot, like, a great example, like Cherie de Valilia Love. I mean, the things that come out of their mouth, I'm like, where did you come up with that? And <laughs> and I'll ask them afterwards, and they're like, I don't know. Yeah. It just comes out of my mouth. Yeah. It's just like, it's incredible. Because, it, it, I mean, it's like the ultimate ad lib. Oh, yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. And you have yeah, to it, be it, able it, to... It is, it is improv. You do have to yes and yes. with Dirty Talk. Yeah. And and also, with, with Dirty Talk specifically, it, it would seem like to me in a conversation on the phone, you have to like read the cues without being able to see the face of the person that you're speaking to and amend maybe what you're talking about to whatever they want. I, I had, um, I don't know if you know, Amberly Rothfield is. Oh, totally. Absolutely. So yes. she came on my show a while ago and she did phone sex and it was just so interesting because she talked about this one guy who just wanted to hear her talk about triangles. Oh yeah. You know? And so she would have to just describe different things that were triangles <laughs> And that was like his Sosceles baby. Yeah. I was just like, and I was trying to like understand what, you know what I mean? 45 degrees. He was just, and then there was another story about how she was talking to some guy who was like hiding from his wife mm. um, while he was talking to her. So he like got in the trunk of the car, but then accidentally locked himself in there. Classic. So then like she had to like help him get out. Trunk of the car. And then that intense traumatic experience created a being locked in the trunk of a car fetish. Yeah. Uh, um, that's, I don't know, that's what would happen to me probably. <laughs> You're like, honey, you gotta, you gotta throw me in the back of the, throw me in the back of the car and drive me around. <laughs> like in that movie, Out of Sight. Have you seen that movie? The Steven Soderbergh so. movie? George think. Clooney and Jennifer Lopez get caught in the trunk of a car together. It's very steamy. Mm. Highly recommend. I'll have to check it out. Cool. <laughs> so what do you think is the most surprising thing that you learned about the phone sex industry doing this podcast? You know, I've said this before, but it really is that, I don't know. It was like surprising, but in some ways, I guess not surprising that like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm-hmm. Like the way that the, I guess the most surprising thing that I learned is that the operators at this company, you know, they worked in a phone room. So they had like a physical, remember when you would go to work in a physical place? Um, (laughs) And so they would go to a room that you, just to look at it, you would think it would be like a telecommunications office. Mm -hmm. Um, And they had, they had shifts and they got healthcare, which is like, and like employment status and like tax forms and everything. So like, you know, uh, in that, like in some ways we can critique that level of respectability. Like you don't need to have that sort of conventional level of respectability in order to have your job be seen as like legitimate and like dignified at the same time, like these kinds of basic labor rights are things that, uh, that unions fight for that, um, you know, that 
like freelancers, especially in today's gig economy, Mm -hmm. like have to fight for the idea that like something like that could be centralized. And also like all of the uh, sort of like regulations and pushback that I was talking about from the phone companies uh, on a corporate level from, uh, you know, the FCC and government uh, regulations, um, you know, from like anti-porn, like political pundits and like sort of cultural forces like that. The company was like absorbing all of that. Mm -hmm. And of course the operators I'm sure had to deal with their own like interpersonal stigma in, Mm -hmm. in their lives, like figuring out whether they're going to be like out to the people in their lives about the fact that they got paid to talk dirty for a living um, and all that kind of thing. Uh, And in some ways they also were like looked down upon by other people in the company, which is something we definitely explore in the show. But like, on the level of sort of like the world coming for them, they did actually have the the, the protection. Of, it was the responsibility of the company itself to deal with that because it was also in their best interest to do so. They mm-hmm. didn't do it to protect their labor force. They mm-hmm. did it to protect their own asses. Right. And so today, even though like content creation platforms online have made it possible for sex workers to seize the means of production and, uh, and like control their own content and to a certain degree, like control their own brand and say like, this is what I want to shoot. This is what I don't want to shoot. This is who I want to work with. This is who I don't. And like set up their own operations at the same time, those like financial pressures and those political pressures and like the sort of the, like social stigma against sex work, like is the same as it ever was. Yeah. And now like, you know, the, the platforms are not protecting the content creators when it comes to that kind of thing. Like mm-hmm. each individual sex worker, like has to like deal with the fact that, you know, last year in 2021, there was the whole only fans like debacle about like, we're not doing adult content anymore. Oh, wait, we are and like the pressure from Visa and MasterCard and all of that, like sex workers are the ones who are like, well, now I can't pay rent anymore. Or like somebody's scamming by asking for a charge back on a service that I provided. Now that money's coming out of my pocket instead of the company's pocket. So mm-hmm. it surprised me to see like all of the things that like I'm engaged with in like my work in my community now, like applied to this company that in a lot of superficial ways, like seems really different Mm -hmm. and sex work seems really different. Um, But I guess I was surprised by all the things that are, that are still the same. The struggle is still the same. I think. What do you think about like the future? Do you have hope for the future of sex work? Or do you think it's a battle we're just going to always have? I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. Like I, I, I always have, have hope, um, for, I'm always like utopia envisioning. Um, I, I mean, I think the thing that gives me hope is that another thing that has changed is that, and that the internet has facilitated for better or worse is sex workers being able to form communities, both like using the internet to form and organize like communities locally, um, but also connecting with other workers all over the world. And I think that those platforms also give us the opportunity to like share our stories and like also say like what, what we demand like from the industry, like what respect we, uh, we deserve for the work that we do. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I think that if there's any, if there's any hope it's in people like, listening to sex workers and sex workers like organizing in a way that there's like clear messaging like now that we have your attention here's what we want and here's how we're gonna make it happen um and i mean i think that i think that people are always going to want adult entertainment and i think that that's beautiful and i think that we should be continuing to provide that and we should get the respect that we deserve for providing something as like fundamental to people's like joy and exploration and like, I don't know, like storytelling is a fundamental part of being human and like sex is part of being human. So why can't we like tell stories about sex, even if they're very crude stories that we're telling with our bodies? Like, um, let's like, 
let's keep doing it. And like, that's why destigmatizing as well as like the idea of like decriminalizing um, the industry is so important to me. Like yeah. people should stop fucking judging. Yeah. I, th- I feel like I'm seeing that change. I mean, I think studies have shown that the younger generation is, is looking, looks at sex work differently than the older generation. I think it's becoming more accepted. And my hope is that technology will, I mean, I think the biggest hurdle that we have to tackle, and this is what the anti-porn companies are attacking us on. And like, there is some, there is some truth in this is, is the exposure of minors to porn. Right. I mean, that's, that's the biggest issue is like the possibility of minors, um, producing porn, um, the possibility of minors accessing porn. And, um, it's my hope that with, uh, the blockchain and the future of crypto, um, that there will be age verification that will be both private mm-hmm. to people and will also um, be a way that people can uh, legitimately prove their age so they can access what they want without having to give credit card information and stuff like that. So, totally. And I'm, I'm seeing that possibility in the future of technology and um, hopefully that's will be something that will, I mean, I think that we'll always be fighting it in some way, but I, so too. I do think that um, we have our advantages that technology has provided us from the community building aspect that you mentioned with, you know, online social media groups to totally. blockchain technology. So, yeah. And I also think that like on the issue of minors, like we need better comprehensive sexual education, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, there's like, that too, because which... you know, that if people, people blame the people say think of the children and we talk about this on operator and um and then that is just this like blanket thing where it's like well you can't argue with like not want you can't say like i don't want to protect children you know <laughs> yeah, so yeah, so it's kind of like putting you it, it, like in a sort of like it's it's it, it puts people who actually like have something like legit to say legit to say about sexual freedom like in a position of like okay first we have to get through talking about like all of this stuff but it's like what about all the adults like yeah. um and like what are the what are the rights and and freedoms uh, that we're fighting for for adults and i i do think that like you know porn literacy is like a bit of a hot button topic and like i think that it's incredibly important that we like teach young people at an age appropriate level, like, like what porn is and what it's meant for, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And like the fact that people are like, kids are learning about sex from porn. It's like, well, like there's a drive of curiosity. So like, if you try to tamp down that curiosity, like that's just history has shown that's not going to, get us anywhere than anywhere that I'd like to be. Um, and so like if there's curiosity, like give kids, like if you want to decide what's appropriate, then like give kids what you think is an appropriate level of like sexual education that actually satisfies their Mm -hmm. curiosity. Um, and then they won't be watching like decontextualized, like rough sex porn and like Mm -hmm. thinking that like everyone likes to be slapped without being asked. Like plenty of people like to be slapped. Like, you got to learn about like how to communicate about it. And like that part is getting left out. I'm not the first person to say that we don't teach kids to drive by showing them fast and the furious movies, but like there's social value, I think to fast and the furious movies. They're fucking fun. Right. We like watching extreme car driving and driving out of helicopters onto um, surfboards or like whatever else they do in those I've movies. I've never seen you know? one of those movies, but I, I get what you're saying. There's cars. They drive very fast. <laughs> <laughs> I know that part. <laughs> they drive cars into buttholes, you know. <laughs> um, it requires a lot of choreography. <laughs> a lot of lube. <laughs> Opening up the camera. Yeah, no, you're, yeah, porn literacy is definitely something we've talked about. I had an interview, if you guys haven't checked it out, with Justine Angfonte, and that's specifically what she does is she teach porn literacy to um, minors in an age-appropriate way without actually showing them porn, lest you suddenly freak out that, uh, <laughs> about that. But, I mean, and even then, so even if we provide some sex education to kids and they still access porn, right, which is probably going to happen because – kids just know how to navigate the internet and it's not the worst ways. thing that could happen right i but mean this might be controversial but i you know i think yeah. there are worse things to happen to 
to young people, but anyway. But at least there would be some context to it. Mm -hmm. You know, but the fact that like we don't talk about it and we just say it's shameful and it's disgusting and it's dirty and like the, I mean, it's just that's not helping the situation. I don't think so. so. I mean, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's talk about your graphic novel. Yes. Um, this is so beautiful. Uh, and I don't know if I can show, I don't think I can show YouTube. It's not safe for work, no, this book. So gonna, oh, <laughs> the fact that. Right. The, yeah, let's just get in on Holly's face looking at the book. Actually, I'm like turning to all the safer work parts, um, <laughs> which is kind of funny. There's, oh, that must be cold. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so tell us tell us about this. And this is a volume two. Yes. So Safe Sex is my science fiction comic book series. Um, I have been... I created it and I've been writing it since 2017. Uh, it's published by Image Comics, which is a, a pretty big uh, a comic book publisher, big deal in the comics industry. And um, uh, the first volume is called Protection, and that's out uh, wherever uh, comics and uh, and like comic books and books are sold. Um, and I recommend people check out their local comic book store, their local bookstore. And then this is the new book, volume two terms of service. And it just came out, uh, in late 2021, also available wherever fine books and comics are sold. And, you know, you can definitely skip to this one. It's meant to be sort of read as its own standalone graphic novel. Um, but if you're interested in the whole series, um, this is the second one, and hopefully there will be more. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank I mean, you. You know what's really funny is just looking at it now, I just realized that she's pulling her own arm, skin, human arm skin she's off. A ro- so she's a robot. She's a robot. I just picked up on that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's subtle, right? Yeah, but <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, weird, like gross and subtle. I love You it. were distracted by the tits, huh? I was. I was, definitely. <laughs> so cool. Thanks. Um, so you also have your own podcast, Why Are People Into That, that explores kinks, which to me is so interesting. So I've actually always wanted to do like a series where I interview people who have specific kinks that like we don't understand and ask them like why and where that came from. So um, do you explore any of that on that show? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, and I say we, I mean me and my guests because it's a total like one woman band, uh, mm-hmm. that podcast. It's totally indie. I've been doing it since 2013. And um, I mean, basically what I do is I choose a guest who is somebody who is comfortable and confident like talking about sexuality. And I ask them like, what's what's a topic that you want to explore and so sometimes they're very like broad and recognizable topics like spanking or bondage um or we'll do like different features on like different parts of the sex industry like uh cam models or strippers um and then sometimes people want to talk about things that they think are sexy that are not necessarily like a fetish so we like had an episode on like why are people into tattoos or like why are people into magic? And we like kind of get into like social cultural stuff in that way. Um, But yeah, then, you know, uh, we will have, um, I'm trying to think of some like recent episodes that are maybe a little bit like uh, weird or off the wall. I mean, I cannot tell you how popular the cannibalism episode was. Uh, really? I had my friend Empress Wu, who's an amazing dominatrix and activist on, and she just has all these fantasies about um, like consuming her lovers. And uh, we, we talked about it and I, you know, you would think that it would be like a topic that would gross people out or freak people out. But that is the episode that I get the most people like, you know, in pre-pandemic times, people would literally come up to me on the street and be like, I love your show, that cannibalism episode, though. Or people will, like, message me about it. And Wu has actually gotten clients, like, who, like, listen to the show and then were like, I want to try one of those fantasies with you because you made it sound so appealing. I think that's kind of the trick of the show is that we will sometimes take dark, edgy fantasies or topics And I don't want to say it's like super cheery all the time um, or that it's like everything's fine. Like, no, you you know, it's not like a like like whitewashed, you know, but um, I like to think that we talk about things in a 
in a way that's non-judgmental and is also so specific and passionate that, um, and like from so many different angles that then even if people don't want to like run out and try things, they like, I guess my goal is that people will judge other people like a little bit less, like yuck other people's yum, like a little bit less Mm -hmm. after hearing an episode on like, a Catholicism fetish or a like boot blacking fetish or like chastity fetish or at like any of the other things that we've done episodes on where it's like sometimes the people that I have on have the fetish themselves. And sometimes it's like a part of their work. Mm -hmm. Um, I had this amazing performance artist and sex worker, Lindsay Dye on to talk about cake sitting. Cause like that's what she specializes in. And uh, you know, I think because it's a conversational show like yours, sometimes I, like discover things that I hadn't thought about. Uh, and the cake sitting one is a perfect example where like the first time I saw one of Lindsay's like videos of cake sitting, I was like, I am mesmerized by this and I don't know why. I mean, I know that it's mostly about your butt. So that's probably why, but there's also something else going on and I need you to explain it to me. And she, because she's a performance artist, she has all these like, conceptual things about like destruction and creation and like that's what I was gonna like say. wet and messy and like there's something about like when you get a beautiful cake like you don't want to cut into it because it's so beautiful you totally. don't want to like destroy it exactly you know yeah and then obviously if you sit in it that's like the ultimate yeah there's there's I feel like there's a lot to unpack there totally yeah what about I sorry I just want to go back to the cannibalism fetish because I do find that really interesting. Absolutely. So, does she, so I'm assuming Mistress Wu she works in like that's part of her service is like this fantasy. Totally. And I know obviously they don't actually eat the people. They don't actually eat the people. So, yes. How, <laughs> it is not a Hannibal yeah. situation. So how does she play into that fetish? Like is it about like the preparation of like cooking the flesh, right? So she like I don't know, stokes a fire, gets the spices out, like turns the oven on and like you're tied up and she has like a knife that she's like sharpening and she's You're a natural at this. (laughs) And then like, how far does she go? Does she just pretend to cut off pieces of flesh? Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I don't know for sure what, like how far she has gone. Yeah, like I just like, how do you, how do you like, finish that fantasy. I mean, there are some people who are, who have fetishes around like understanding how to safely like do some levels of, of bloodletting. Right, um, okay. uh, and like, I've also had an episode, um, uh, about like wired people into blood that like talked about all the different ways that you can potentially play with blood. Like sometimes people like knife play sometimes with like needle play. There's like a little bit of blood, like, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, so, like, you know, it's, it's not safe to consume like large quantities of human blood. I am not a doctor, but I have it under advisement. That, <laughs> um, probably not a good idea to have like a pint, like, yeah. uh, with some vodka, like a bloody Mary, yeah. um, a little celery, a little bacon. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think a lot of the time it's about, it is about dirty talk because mm-hmm. like cannibalism is so dark and so taboo by the way, this is one taboo I endorse. I don't endorse all, like, you know, there's a lot of taboos that I'm like, this shouldn't be a taboo, but like incest, Mm -hmm. cannibalism, I'm on board. We should, we should like, we should not do those things. And we should think like we should teach people from a young age. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, but you know, one of the things that we talked about in the episode is like, and this is a this is a good example of how I like to approach these topics is like okay you hear cannibalism you think horror you think violence you think homicide right mm-hmm. like you think like very bad things that we like actually shouldn't do but then when you really think about what it means to eat someone like when you make out with someone you are probably going to end up swallowing some of their saliva mm-hmm. when you go down on someone, like whether you swallow or not, like you're getting like some of their sexual fluids in your mouth. Mm -hmm. If you lick someone, especially if you are into like sweaty armpits, you're like consuming their, you know, so Mm -hmm. like, like from a fluids perspective, like we actually like consume one another all the time. Mm -hmm. And even if we're not consuming 
a part of someone, like even people who are into worship, whether it's feet or legs or genitals or tits or whatever, like or even necking, right? Like what could be more wholesome than necking? Like you are kind of like licking and chewing on someone. Like anytime you're putting your mouth on another person's body, there is an element of like, I want to smell you. I want to taste you. And I also think there is something that is like quite innocuous and wholesome about like old ladies being like, oh, I just like, like, you're so cute. I just want to eat you. Like people say that all the time, right? To be fair, like I do like, I have a, a one one and a half year old. Actually, she's not even one and a half yet. And I'm just like, exactly. Because they're so cute and chunky. Exactly. Right. <laughs> um, there's, um, but you're not like, that's. I'm not, <laughs> not going to eat my child. Not no. to put too fine a point on it, but you're not going to eat your child. No. And there's also like nothing like erotic about that. No, no, no. Again, no, no. I know that's like, <laughs> doesn't need to be said, but, um, yeah. but you know, but then when you do take those sort of like fundamental things into adulthood. Like I know how it feels to be so obsessed with someone that I'm like, I just want to like consume you. I like, you know, that's and, the, the ultimate way to like bring them into you. Right. Exactly. To like, and, and make sure they never go away. Yeah. They're just, yeah. Yeah. yeah and like, me, like melding and like becoming a part of you. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, I, uh, definitely have had like, sub, like relationships with submissives who like, want to drink my piss in like a golden shower setting Mm -hmm. because they like, they like worship me so much that like even my waist is like divine and they just Mm want to like, like take me like into their body. It's like a, it's a privilege for them to have me inside of their bodies. Or it can also be humiliation. Like this is the closest that you are like ever going to get to my body is Mm -hmm. like drinking my piss. But like, Mm -hmm. again, it's like, you are technically like consuming a part of my body when you do that. What about scat play? Because I had this guy. Everybody always wants to ask about scat. <laughs> I had this guy that used to write to me like yearly and he would always up the price every time. And he wanted to eat my poop. Um, he called it scat caviar and toilet treats, which was. <laughs> and every time he'd like offer me a little bit more money and I was like, dude, there's no way it's going to happen. Um, do people actually generally eat it or is it about, they do, they do. How do they not get sick? So I'm not a doctor. Um, I have, I will, I will put it to you this way here today on your podcast, which will be broadcast and live on the internet forever. I have witnessed with my own eyes, uh, people erotically consuming human excrement. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm just trying so hard not to <laughs> it, gag. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's gross. Um, I agree. Um, I will say that I, as, as I have like spoken about at length, like my work is very devoted to like, um, you know, unpacking taboos and like separating, uh, taboos from like, uh, unnecessary shame. That's about like social control and like blah, blah, blah. Um, but, uh, like that's another, go ahead and add that to the list. That is another, (laughs) um, taboo, uh, that I, I like two thumbs up from me. Like, let's continue to have a shit eating taboo. (laughs) Don't do that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and so I, I don't know the answer to your question. Like, uh, everything about like what the risks are of, um, uh, consuming, uh, human excrement uh, for a human to consume, uh, excrement. Um, I've definitely seen people like do it and live to tell the tale, um, or, they, or, or like, like live to come back for more, uh, do they, like, for years. Enjoy it. Like, do they, or do, do they gag? Like, is there, um, how do they, I've, like, se- react? I've it- seen, I've seen it all. I've seen, uh, like I said, I worked in a dungeon. Right. Um, so, uh, and by the way, like just like working as a dominatrix doesn't mean that you have to like watch people eat shit all day. Um, uh, the dungeon that I worked at was a place where you were, um, you know, really allowed to be like, this is something that I will like, this is something I'll participate in. This is something I'll watch. This is something I'll do as a dominant. This is something I'll do as a submissive. Like, so, you know, um, I, I felt so curious about it kind of in the same way that like Mm -hmm. you're asking the questions about it. And I was like, well, I'm, 
in a position to actually like witness it firsthand. So like, I, I don't know. I, I think I also have like a high tolerance for like grossness when I'm, when I'm like curious about something mm -hmm. I can like handle a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, sometimes it was about, and I think that this, by the way, like applies to a lot of like dark fantasies, um, and like more like intense, like edge play BDSM activities. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes what is appealing to people about it is, is like that extreme like sense of like repulsion or objection or like horror, like they want, because you know, like fear is physiologically a very like similar uh, reaction in mm -hmm. the human body to arousal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that like fight or flight, uh, like nervous response. Um, so sometimes it's like, a way of accessing excitement. Um, and you know, I will compare it to a roller coaster or bungee jumping or even like watching a horror movie, right? Like we clearly humans enjoy getting like freaked out in a negative way, mm -hmm. not just in a like puppy dogs and rainbows way. Mm -hmm. Um, so sometimes people like wanted to do it because it was so humiliating or they wanted to be objectified as a toilet or they just like wanted this like extreme feeling. Um, and sometimes it was the thing that I was talking about with golden showers where it was like, I worship you so much that like even your shit is like caviar to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's like the trip that they're on. Um, I think some, yeah, I mean, that's, I could, I could go on, but like, uh, I, I kind of think that those are just some examples of like what the deal is with what we mm -hmm. used to call the brown shower, um, <laughs> which is extra by the way. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it is, I will say like one of the things that I always, that <laughs> there were a lot of things that I like especially in my early days learning about BDSM that I would be like, you know, clients would come in and they would be like, Oh my God, it's like so crazy and shameful that I want you to put on a strap on and fuck me in the ass. I would be like, what are you talking about? This is regular schmegular, like yeah. everyday stuff, you know, but yeah. like, fine. If you want to like have a, a scene around like being my little bitch, that's fine. Like, here's my rate for that. Um, scat play was always something that I was like, I'm not going to tell someone not to do it, but like, hope, I hope you get like a kink affirming therapist to like yeah. talk about this with, because that's part of the other thing is that then like people go to sex workers who are like willing to provide that service. Yeah. And then we end up doing a lot of emotional labor that like in, in some sex workers are also like clinical professionals, um, mm -hmm. care professions, those care professions go together actually quite well. Mm. Um, but, uh, I myself am not like a licensed therapist. So there's like only so much like coaching and like support and encouragement I can give someone before it's like, maybe you should talk to someone about this, but also like, it's gotta be really hard to find someone that you feel like you can talk about that with that is not then going to try to like, you know, have you committed against your will? Like, so, yeah. because I don't know. Anyway, that's complicated, but, yeah. um, uh, I guess I hope also for the future that we have more like kink aware and kink affirming therapists who like, like, I can't tell you how refreshing it is for me to have a therapist where I can talk about being queer, uh, being a sex worker, uh, you know, like being kinky and like being a, like proud pervert, like being polyamorous, being slutty and like, I don't have to like, I have had the experience of having therapists where it's like, okay, now I'm educating you. So at the very least I should be getting this session for free or maybe yeah. you should be paying me. Yeah. Um, but it's so rewarding to like have therapists who understand like how to talk about the, the things that are causing me distress, not just immediately assuming that like, kink or sex work is in and of itself like fundamentally distressing and the first step is like stop doing that mm -hmm. you know yeah, um, yeah yeah so anyway yeah it was interesting i had dr david lay on a while ago oh yeah and he talked about i think he said that in order to get your license you only needed like what like a very minimal amount of hours which totaled like one day on like any education about sex and like sex therapy and that was like 
you know, like an abysmally small part. And then, and then sex workers like end up doing a lot of that work, which in some cases is like really wonderful and sex workers can be healers um, in addition to being entertainers. Uh, but like also it, it's, that's like a big like burden to put on us, you know, especially if we like aren't like equipped to do that or if there's like a false pretense, like that's the thing that drives me crazy is when someone's like, I'm here to be entertained and then, and you're like, great, I offer that. And then someone's like, and also help me fix my marriage. And it's like, well, I could, I'll talk to you about anything that you want, but like. Yeah. I get it. Quite a few people on my OnlyFans ask me about, um, their sex life with their wife and like how to improve that. And I'm just how does like, that make you feel? Uh, I mean, it makes me feel unqualified to really give them, uh, honestly, a lot of times I will point them to my podcast and I'll be like, you know what? I don't really know, but I did a podcast with this person who seemed to be really knowledgeable on that subject. So why don't you watch this episode? And maybe like, if you want to inquire further, maybe contact them directly. Totally. Um, because like, you know, I, I can't, I don't really know. Well, you're like curating people that then can be like a portal for people's research, yes. right? Where they can be like, okay, I'm familiar with this person because I like saw them on Holly's podcast and that like made me feel really like comfortable with them. And I like heard them talk. So now I'm going to go to their website. Cause yeah. I feel like a lot of, um, like, like social scientists and like medical professionals and definitely like social workers and mental health care professionals also are aware that like if you've only heard about them, they can't like take on the world's like sex problems. Yeah. So they will usually be a part of a network or like point you to other resources. Yeah. Uh, and they're like happy to do that because they know like how little like networking and resources there are out there. Yeah. So um, Manhattan alternative is a really awesome resource. Like it is like folks who I think who are based in New York state. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that is a, a, a place where like, uh, like kink and queer affirming uh, therapists uh, like have a network. And I think then through then you can um, find folks to like provide services like wherever you are. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I know that for the adult industry, we have pineapple support. Yes. Um, which is there to provide therapy um, and guidance for people working in the adult industry because so many sex workers find it very, find it very difficult to find therapists who aren't judgmental about what you do for a living. Cause so many people will just jump on the fact, Oh, you're a sex worker. That's the root of your problem. Exactly. So like once you get out of that career, then you'll, you'll fix everything. And, um, that's just not the case. It's not the case. And actually it's, it's kind of, it's very sad, but it also, um, it upsets me a bit when I see people, you know, I, I will often get people come at me with a list of like performers who've committed suicide and they'd be like, Oh, it's because they worked in porn. But a lot of times that suicide happened years after they left the industry. Um, and you know, maybe the stigma of being in porn did contribute to their, you know, demise, I don't know, but I think also too, like there are so many other underlying issues that they must have been experiencing. Totally. And also like correlation is not causation, yeah. you know, like it, to get into, not to get too maybe deep into like heavy topics, but like we also talk about this with regards to the statistics around like how many people in sex work have like there's a stereotype that, oh, you must be doing this because you like experienced some kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. And like, there are sex workers who have experienced abuse or come from a background of abuse or have trauma like related to sexuality or like interpersonal violence. Um, but that's because of what a large portion of the population in general or like women in general or tra trans people in general have experienced that. Yeah. And also but you only focus on the sex workers experience, but I was, I was going to agree with you and say that that's so true. I know so many women who work in a multitude of different careers that have nothing to do with sex work that have experienced trauma and abuse. It's like, it's like, I feel like it's not, it doesn't correlate specifically to the adult industry. It's actually, unfortunately an issue that we have across the board with everybody. Yeah. And that's how it needs to be addressed because yeah. if you focus in on like creating this like false correlation, then you're not doing any service to like anybody who is a survivor, like mm -hmm. whether they do sex work or not. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, and yeah. I've also spoken to a lot of women who have um, said that porn actually gave them like their power back over sexuality. 100%. It was therapeutic for them in some way. And of course, this is not like for everybody. Everybody has a different story. But totally. it, it has, you know, had the opposite effect for some people than what most. So, I mean, I just think it's important to recognize that everybody's different. Totally. And an individual and not to like kind of throw this blanket statement over the entire porn industry that like you're all broken, like you're all... Um, you come from, all of you come from a fucked up background and porn is just making it worse. And I think it's also really sad that there are so many people who are consumers of adult entertainment who then like carry those judgments. And this is uh, uh, just to give a, like a tease to bring it back to operator. There is a theme and I, I won't spoil anything or like give too much away, but, um, just to give a little tease, like, there's a theme in one character in particular um, who, uh, by character I mean a real person who, who appears on the show, um, who had a tremendous amount of ambivalence about working in the industry and like the effect that it had on his life. And by it, I mean the ambivalence and like the sort of like self judgment that was going on. Um, was was really profound and and we we really explore that and it's a big part of like sort of the climax of the story and um you know when I look at that I think what could and this is somebody working in the industry but not like directly like providing sexual services but like facilitating um I ask myself what would that person's life have been like if they had had support from their friends, from their community, from if they had books to read or resources, if they had a therapist, if they had like people in their lives and like social and cultural messages in their lives that said, you can be proud of doing this. All the things that you're proud of are not undermined by the fact that it is for people to jerk off on the phone. And um, I, I mean, I think about that all the time, like how many people, and I'm sure there are people who are listening to this right now who like listen to the show because they love porn and they love like listening to people who have worked in porn or related industries like talk about it um which is great hello we love you um I'm I'm uh, I'm like you I don't just want to watch porn I want to talk about it I want to like know everything that there is to know about it that's why I worked in it um I'm that kind of pervert uh proudly and like I but I, then I feel like there are so many people who like carry all of that judgment and it's also preventing them from being able to like fully enjoy the, the like entertainment that we create and the service that we provide, you know, it's like a sad, like tangled fucked up world. So I don't think we can just like wave our magic wands and like get rid of shame. Like, I don't think that we can like, you know, in one fell swoop, like rid ourselves of like stigma around sex forever. Um, but I think like in whatever way we can, like through that, I mean, I guess that's kind of like the mission of my work is being realistic about like how we can make that change because I do, I think the world would be a better place if we stopped yeah. shitting on each other. If we, stopped literally shit well, no no figuratively. figuratively we stopped figuratively shitting in each other's mouths <laughs> yeah i mean i think that the stigma around sex work is the most damaging thing because it totally. isolates people exactly and a lot of these people that you see who run into these serious mental health issues are often people who have been ostracized from their family and their friends because of what they do or you know um, don't have a community that they feel like they belong to or feel ostracized from that community. You know, the way that, that the stigma and the shame around sex work can have you, force your parents to disown you. Totally. Is like, it's a terrible thing. Or if you want to have another job at the same time, or you do want to stop making porn and get into another field, that, uh, you know, there are when people talk about criminalization of sex work, it's not just about like arrest and incarceration, although it is about that, but it's also about like regulations in like uh, employment and education. There was a, a case recently in the news of a woman who successfully sued her nursing school for basically like intimidating her out once they found out that she had a background in porn and she effectively sued using title nine, which basically makes 
sex-based discrimination unlawful. And this is like a landmark case in using Title IX as like anti-sex work discrimination because the people at her school were like, well, you're not fit to be, you're not the kind of woman. They literally said, you're not the kind of woman who is fit to be a nurse because you have a previous career in porn or you have done porn. Oh God, that's amazing to hear because I know exactly what you're talking about. This is up in Oregon, right? I think so. I think yeah, so. I can't remember the woman's name. I've talked about her on this podcast before because I remember when that came out. I was so infuriated by it. Um, I knew that she was gearing up to um, bring a case against them, but I didn't know that she had and she had won. So that's it just amazing. happened like two weeks ago. Okay, that's amazing. I'm yeah. going to look into that more. Um, but yeah, I was so infuriated because I was like, okay, this is so unfair. You know, this this woman came into porn. She did it for like a year or something. Like, I don't even know, remember who she was. She like didn't do that many scenes, decided it wasn't for her, moved on. She did with so many critics of porn say, exactly. get out of porn and get a real job. That's what she did. And then she was pushed out of the real job because she had done porn in the past. Like, I mean, if you truly believe that, you know, your anti-porn sentiment is to save people from this industry. And if you tell somebody who's a sex worker to get out of porn and get a real job, shouldn't you support them in that transition to the real job? It's so hypocritical. And I think that it's a sign that people who do say things like that and people who are anti-porn actually really, and there's lots of amazing people have, have written about this. Um, like they're actually just trying to say like this kind of woman does this and this kind of woman is pure. Mm. Right. And actually that is one of, um, see how I keep bringing things back great. to my, yes. uh, one of the themes of safe sex, because it, it takes place in like an American dystopia, a like not too distant future of mm -hmm. like extreme, like sexual policing and bureaucracy and oppression, which is actually really not that different from the world that we live in. Um, <laughs> uh, but there's also sex robots. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and like, like that's part of, part of the, the theme of the, of the book that I made is like the government's obsession with purity. I basically just like took all the stuff we're talking about and to make science fiction just like made it like super literal and absurdist and extreme. And that's really, I think like the legacy of like dystopian science fiction and satire is like, especially if you like come from a marginalized community, like, you know, like being queer, like being a sex worker, it's like, I'm in a position to see like, I'm like already in a dystopia, you know? And I also feel like it's important for me to recognize like as a white person, there are ways that like, I don't even see a dystopia that's already happening for mm -hmm. people of color in the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, particularly in America. So mm -hmm. like try to like bring those, those themes in too. But, um, this like obsession with, purity I think is and like the idea that like once you've done sex work once like once you have like gotten naked on camera you're like tainted in some way forever mm -hmm. and that like hypocrisy of like you have to stop doing that you need to be rescued we're not going to provide you with any services or path or like rights so that you can like do something else we're just going to say like eh, like don't do that because like it's like the virginity myth and the idea yeah. that you've been like you're like a chewed up piece of gum or what the fuck ever. Yeah. Like, um, and it's like, well, this chewed up piece of gum would like to be a nurse now, you know? Yeah. Um, so we, we, we need to work on that too. Yeah. My God. Tina, thank you so much for coming on. We could have gone on. <laughs> We've gone on for <laughs> almost like an hour and a half. This is, this is, um, it's, this what you get with Tina Horn. It's just, um, <laughs> uh, why say five words when I could say 500, <laughs> but it's also just such a pleasure talking to you. And I'm like longtime fan, like first time caller, first time, uh, guest. guest? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you. No, it's been such a pleasure having you. This has been like so entertaining and educational. Awesome. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, all your links, all your plugs? Totally. So my, my plugs, uh, <laughs> my, uh, I'm just like a 13 year old boy. Um, <laughs> uh, you can get plugged by me, cut plugged into me at tinahorn.net. That's T I N A H O R N. Um, I am on Twitter and Instagram at Tina Horn's ass. Um, nobody watching on the cameras can quite see, um, that I've sort of, um, famous, uh, for my most like legendary, uh, asset. So that's why I made it my Twitter handle. So that's 
T-I-N-A-H-O-R-N-S-A-S-S. It could also be Tina Horn Sass if you're wanting to be more PG about it. Um, And then I have a Patreon. You can search for Tina Horn there. Um, Yeah, and then I've, I've written a bunch of books and like my... There's all, all the stuff that you would need um, uh, to get as like a portal to what I do is at tinahorn.net. Why are people into that? Is my indie podcast, which you can listen to wherever you pod. Operator is out now on the Wondery app or wherever you pod. Safe Sex is my like newest book that I really want people to check out. And that's at books and comic book stores online or in the flesh anywhere. And um that's that's me. That's what I do. That's a lot. That's where to find me. Yeah. yeah, you're an accomplished woman. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm very tired, <laughs> but I'm staying hydrated. So, <laughs> and you can find me at Holly Randall at Twitter and on Instagram. And of course, support this podcast by going to Patreon.com/slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. Make sure that you go ahead and follow Tina. Make sure that you listen to her podcast, buy her book, and maybe drop her a line and say that you heard her here on the show so she knows that her time was worthwhile. (laughs) Thank you guys so much for watching and we will see you next week.